Um, all right, uh, so hey guys, uh, welcome back to our beginner lecture series. And this week we're gonna be talking about code forces A and B problems. <clears throat> so um, code forces A and B problems, uh, they can seem really intimidating at first, um, but usually they rely on like one simple trick that like simplifies the structure of the problem a lot and makes the code like very easy to write. Um, so most of the work isn't actually in like writing the code, it's in sort of like thinking about the problem and figuring out this trick. Um, and it's sort of a hard thing to like teach without doing a lot of problems. So that's basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a lot of problems, uh, give you guys some practice uh, thinking about these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, you can get right into it with the first problem. Okay, um, so in this first problem, you're given a two by N grid of rooms uh, where all rooms that are horizontally adjacent, so if they're like next to each other, left and right, they're connected. And then you're given a string S um, of size N, where if SI equals one, then you have a staircase at point I, which means you can move between the top and bottom rooms at position I. And you wanna know what's the greatest number of rooms you can visit starting from any point you want if you're not allowed to visit any room twice. Uh, so for example, um, in this case here, um, if you have like n equals six and then s is this, you can see that we have a staircase in the middle four positions because these are one, but on these uh, outer two positions, that's zero. Um, so we don't have a staircase there. And in this case, uh, the answer is 10 because you can do something like this um, as your path, but you can't get more than that without visiting a room twice. Um, and one thing I want to say before we get into solving it is um, in a lot of these problems, when they give you like this sample input and like the sample solution, um, they'll sort of try to throw you off a little bit with it um, and like give you a solution that's kind of leading you in the wrong direction. So I, I will say that's kind of what we have here um, with this solution that's like snaking up between the top and the bottom. So your one hint is it's not really gonna look like this in the general case. Um, but yeah, so is the problem statement clear to everyone? So you guys can start thinking about how you would solve that problem. And one thing that usually helps when you're doing these kinds of problems um, is if you try to like put bounds on it and be like, well, there's absolutely no way you can do better than this um, or something like that. And then try to see if there's a way to get there. Another sort of general hint, uh, similar to what Joe said, is you can maybe try to think about specific types of, of questions that they can ask, like spe in specific instances of the problem. You can be like, oh, in this case, I know the answer is going to be this. Um, maybe it can, and in this case, I know it's going to be this. Maybe that those two points together will give you sort of general answer. Or, or some guess at yeah. a general answer, at least. Yeah, a lot of these problems we're going to do today kind of split into two cases. So thinking about different cases helps. Someone said something. Um, can you always get an extra one? Yeah. Yeah, so for each staircase, you can always get at least one extra one. Um, and yeah, you can always do at least N. Um, but what if we had an example, like say, what if this staircase was missing? Um, could we still get 10?
And I guess another question would be, um, so we can always get at least n. Um, what are the cases where we can only get n? All zero. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the only time that we can only get n is when there's no staircases. Because um, in that case, uh, all we can do is stay on the same floor. So we can like go across and that's the best we can do. Every I other think time you can my, do. I think yeah. my approach is that like, I can just uh, keep track of the count of zero and then if it's one, I'll just times two. Uh, what's times two? Uh, if it's one, that means that I can uh, sort of go into two rooms. If okay. it's zero, then only one room, right? Well, well, so that's not a very good strategy as, as a very pathological example. Consider a string where it's all zeros except at the, at the last character it's a one. Um, with your approach, you maybe only do like n plus one or something like you said, right? But in reality, you can go all along the top, go down, and right. go all on the bottom, similar to how this snake here. And that gives right. you all so, like, two rooms. So what Akif is saying is if you only had a staircase here in the last one, you could go across mm -hmm. and then down and then back. And then you would get all 2n. And that's, uh, okay. that's actually a much better example of what you would want to do than the snaking, which, like I said, the snaking is kind of intentionally deceptive. Uh -huh. So uh, another thing to think about is so if the snaking is not like an optimal way to do this, what what is like another way that you could get 10 rooms on this example? That might be more easy to generalize. You could go all the way across the bottom until you get to the fifth square and then go up and go all the way back. Right. Um, so you go up until the last staircase and then back. And that also gives you 10. So what's a nice way you could sort of generalize that? Oh, wait, I did not mean to click that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so how could you generalize the approach of like going out to the fifth one here and coming back for like any case. Um, yes, so it turns out in the solution we have, we're basically going to be minimizing the amount of stairs we use. So how can we get to the most amount of rooms with minimal number of stairs is the question. Yeah. Uh, so Jason basically has it. Um, so what you want to do is you want to find the one that is the closest to one of the endpoints. So you can do like the furthest along one, like here you can go like that. Um, in this case, since this staircase and this staircase are sort of equally close to the end, you can also go like this, right? And so in the general case, what you want to do is find the one that's the closest to one of your endpoints and you move in sort of the U pattern that we had. Um, and then the number of rooms excluded is just everything left on this segment here. Um, and so we can show that this is maximal because um, if you think about uh, sort of the, the number of rooms you have on this side that we're not using, right? Um, we know that we have at least that many on this side that also have no staircase, right? Because if if we had um, like a staircase here, we would have chosen this one because this staircase is the closest to the end and we could have just gone across like this. So the fact that we're not going to any of these means that we have these two squares here that also don't have staircases in them, which means um, 
we kind of have to choose between, for example, this square um, and this square if we want to go in both rows. We can't um, we can't go in this square and this square and also use a staircase. Right, and there's a similar idea here. We can't go here and here and also use the staircase. Um, so you, you sort of have to pick two out of four of these chains you have hanging off the end with no staircase. And by picking the two longest ones, um, you're making it as long as... I'm not clicking. I don't know why it keeps doing this. Uh, and by picking the two longest ones, you're maximizing the length of your path. So any questions about that? What if the string is randomized with like a bunch of uh, number one and zero? Is that right? So in in any case, the only staircases we care about are the ones that are closest to the endpoints. So like it doesn't matter if this staircase is here or this one, uh, we're still going to get the same answer because we're we're not using those basically. Oh, okay, I see. So yeah, so all you have to do is iterate over your string um, and find the one that's closest to the endpoints. Um, and otherwise, if you don't find any, like we talked about before, the answer is just n. Any other questions? All right. I just want to say one thing, like uh, the, the solution to the problem sort of, or how, how Joe solved it, um, reveals like a, like a sort of way to think about these problems, which is if you can just make a guess at what the answer is based on intuition, then yeah. you can go back and be like, okay, how will I prove that this guess is correct? And it gives, actually gives the best answer. Yeah. Okay. Wait, how, how do you make a guess then? Like in that case? So one way is you can look at a bunch of different cases. So like uh, we looked at the case where, oh, if you have one at the end point, then you can always get all of them. Or, oh, if you don't have any, then you can only get N. And so by looking at like a bunch of different cases, um, you can kind of get an idea of what works and what doesn't. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, so next problem. Okay, so in this problem, uh, you're given an array of n integers and an array b of zeros and ones. Um, and you can... You can swap any uh, elements AI and AJ. You can swap any AI and AJ as long as BI does not equal BJ. Um, so as long as like say BI is zero and BJ is one, right? Um, and the question is, can you sort A? And all you have to do is print yes or no. You don't have to actually do the swaps. Um, so in this example, like let's say A is three, one, two and B is zero, zero, zero. Um, you can't make any swaps because all the B values are equal, right? So this is not sorted, so no. Uh, and in this case, if you have the one has B uh, I equal one and the other ones have B I equal zero, um, you can, how would you do this? You can swap the one and the three. Oh no, you can swap the one and the two and then you can swap the one and the three, right? Because after swapping the one and the two, you have three, two, one. And after swapping the one and the three, you get one, two, three. And note that we have to use the one in both of those cases because that's the only one that can be swapped with the other ones. You can't swap the two and the three. Wait, are, do bees work on the actual element, original elements or on the indices? Oh yeah, so bees stay with their elements. So when you swap AI and AJ, you're also swapping BI and BJ. So for example, this one will always have a B value of one, no matter where you swap it around. So the B values are like on the elements, not on the positions. That's, that's important. All right.
Okay, um, small spellings p value. Um, so that's on the right track. Uh, it's definitely a good thing to think about. Um, like given two elements, can we swap these elements? Um, so, right, so you're basically iterating through from the smallest to the biggest and seeing can you swap it like into its position. Yeah, so that's um, that's on the right track. Definitely think about uh, whether you can swap a given pair of elements. To sort the B array. Um, so you're saying like, look at all the elements that have B value zero and see if they're sorted in A. Um, so in this case, we have the three has B value zero and the two also has B value zero. So the if we look at B equals zero, the A values are not sorted, but it's still possible. So one other thing um, that can be helpful with these problems is if you think about all the cases that don't work um, and just, uh, this is probably not a great strategy in general, but if you find a bunch of cases that don't work um, and then sort of assume that everything else works, uh, sometimes you can submit that and it'll work without actually knowing why it works. But in this case, um, Try, try to figure out what doesn't work and see if you can like prove that everything else works. I feel like the way I would do it is I would loop through the array and um, like all the elements to see if they're, uh, I have to swap them. So for uh, in this case, three, one, I have, that means I have to swap one and three. So I will check the index in array B to see if it's working. So if it's not, like I will just return false. If it's true, I'll keep going. What if there's another way you could swap them? Cause like in this example, you have to swap the two and the three, right? but you can't yeah. directly swap them. You can like sort of use the one to do that. Yeah, maybe, here's another hint, I guess. Maybe in general, a sub problem to consider is um, in what conditions can you swap two elements through some chain yeah. swappings? Right, yeah. Again, here, same thing applies from the last problem. Just make a guess and see if you can prove it to yourself, uh, the, what the condition yeah. is.
So does anyone have any guesses? Like even anything unproven? I have a question. But, yeah. So when I swap the elements from A array, do I also have to swap the elements uh, in yes. B array? Okay. Yes, when you, when you swap so, the A values, you also swap the B values. I feel like my approach might work, but it's kind of slow because, so I would do, I, I sort of have two pointers, uh, points to the first one and the second one, and sort of like go on and on. So if, in this case, I have three, one, two, and the other one is like zero uh, for B array, I have zero, one, zero. And then I would check, Okay, the first one, the first pointer is pointing at three, and then the second one is at one, and then I would check if the second pointer is greater, uh, is smaller than the first pointer. And then I will sort of swap them. I will sort of like, I will check the condition if uh, in B array, if uh, the elements are the same. If they're not, like that means I can swap them. I would just do it. And then I would um, get the, first pointer that uh, to point at the second element and then sort of move the second one forward and then i will check again um be, so not sure that's, that makes sense. that's like a good division into cases of like if you're trying to make a given swap um if the b values are different then you're good right because you just make the swap yeah um so let's say you're trying to make like some arbitrary swap like between i and j um how would you do that if their B values are the same? Uh, what do you mean? Don't, don't even think about the sorting. Just can you make the swap between AI and AJ if they have the same BI, BJ values? Yeah, so I would check, I would check the elements in B array if they are the same. If they're not the same, I can just swap it. Like, right, right, right. But if they are the same, uh, how would you swap them? If Wait, wait, you mean the elements in A array or B array? In, in uh, B array. Like if you want to swap them, but their B values are the same, is there some like indirect way you could do that? I, I think Ambika has, I have to... uh, has- Oh, is thoughts. there something in chat? Yeah. That part's yes. pretty much correct. Maybe elaborate. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is, um, so it turns out um, it's always possible as long as all BI are not the same. Um, and if all bi are the same, then we just have to check if a is sorted, because if all the bi are the same and a is sorted, then you're done. But if all the bi are the same and it's not sorted, then you can't do any swaps. That's false. Um, but otherwise, it is always possible because um, you can like basically get a middle element and use that to swap ai and aj. So uh, we can actually swap any two elements. Um, using at most three swaps basically so if their b values are different we could just do the swap right um and if they're the same we can find an element that has a different b value right because we know there's at least one because not all the bi are the same so you find one b value that's different and then you can do the following swaps so like here if this is our initial setup we can swap i and k Note that all of our swaps uh, have to involve AK because that's the only one um, with the B value that works. Um, so we swap I and K. So now AK is here, AI is here. We can swap I and J because AK is now in slot I, right? And by swapping that, we get this. And now by swapping J and K, we get this. And as you can see, AK is back where it was, and AJ and AI have been swapped. So we can do any swap we need like that. Um, and then by doing some sequence of these swaps, we can sort the array. Any questions about this? All right. Um, Oh, wait, here. Oh, yeah, I just saw chat. Uh, yeah, we got you're right. You, you can use the swaps to reach any permutation. Yeah. OK, uh, so moving on. So we're now going to talk about uh, constructive problems. Uh, basically, the idea behind a constructive problem is you have to print out uh, some output that satisfies some given constraint. 
Um, and usually there's a lot of outputs that will satisfy this. You just have to give one. Um, and the trick with these is usually that there's some like very nice um, like output that you can print out that'll work. Um, so the, the key here is not to overthink it because a lot of these problems will have very simple answers. Um, so I guess to get started, we have this problem. Okay, so you're given a number x and you wanna find integers a and b such that they're between one and x. Um, a is divisible by b. Their product is greater than x and a divided by b is less than x or print out that um, there's no solution. So if we look at the examples, for x equals 10, you can do eight, four, right? Because uh, 32 is greater than 10 and two is less than 10. You have the same, the same idea here with x equals three, you can do a equals two, b equals two, but for x equals one, there's no solution. So is the problem clear? Okay, um, so yeah, for this one, I would say definitely do not overthink it. Think about like, what's the simplest thing you could do? And, and again, uh, the sample output often tries to mislead you or hide the trick. Uh, you um, can just make x really, really big, right? That's what the problems often do. Yeah. They'll make x like 10 to the 18. And even square root of x would probably can't even, I'm not sure you can brute force that, but even that is too big. Man. Uh, 2 and n minus 1. Um, so if n is even, then n minus 1 is not going to be divisible by 2. So Jason was kind of on the right track, um, but even simpler than what Jason had. Okay, so x minus two or x minus one. Um, so if you have a very big n, like a very big x, that will work, right? So like, let's say you have x equals 20. Um, then if you do like say 18, two, then that would work. Um, but I think for some smaller X, that's not going to work. Like, let's say we did, um, X equals two, then this would give us, uh, two zero, which is invalid because we can't use zero. Um, but think even simpler, think even simpler than what we guys are doing. Wait, I think someone's not muted. It's, it causes a lot of noise. Joe, you can mute people. Oh, okay. Great. So I think it's kind of tricky. <laughs> I think if it's one, that means like it's there's no solution. Um. Well, if it's two, like. Oh okay, yeah, anything other than two, I would say like. Uh, let's say three, it's going to be two, two. Let's say four, I can just do like three, three. A equals three, B equals three. You're very close. Um, I will give you the hint that it is possible for two using a similar idea. Uh, I'll just do like one, two. 
like A goes to one and B goes to for two. Uh, that. Well, that, that wouldn't satisfy this, right? Because then you'd have AB equals X. Oh. Wait, does it have to be like integer? Yeah, it has to be an integer. Oh, uh, okay. You're very close. So Roger, that's the question. I'm not sure the answer is. Oh, yes. A and B can be the same, like you have in uh, the X equals 3 case here. Uh, yeah, so A and B equals X minus 1 um, is close. That will work for anything bigger than 2. Yeah, Peter got it. You can just do X and X for anything bigger than 1. Because... Um, oh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with these, you have to look at the constraints a lot because you do have less than or equal to X here. Yeah, I didn't know B can, can be equal to X. I thought yeah. B must be uh, less than X. Yeah, well... Yeah, with these, it's very important to pay attention to the constraints because they do do stuff like this a lot. Um, so if you choose A equals B equals X, everything just works out because they're both in this range. Uh, A is divisible by B because uh, it's divisible by itself. Um, you have X squared is greater than X for X equals greater than 1. And A over B is 1, which is less than X. So the only case where it doesn't work is when X equals 1. Um, so this is kind of the kind of trick that shows up a lot in these constructive problems. Um, you have to sort of think what's the simplest possible thing you could do. Um, and again, the constraints uh, are very important to pay attention to. Any questions on this? All right, um, so the next one. Okay, so in this one, uh, you're given n and m, and you have to output a grid with n rows and m columns, uh, colored white and black, um, where if you let w be the number of white cells touching a black cell, and b be the number of black cells touching a white cell, you have to have b equals w plus one. So in this case, every single white cell is touching a black cell, right? Um, so w equals four in this case, and every black cell is touching a white cell, so we have b equals five. And by touching, we mean only sides. So diagonally does not count. Um, so like, for example, this cell is touching two white cells here, uh, and this one is touching only one. But again, we just care about the number that are touching at least one. Um, so yeah, you're, you're, all you're given for the input is n and m, and you're printing out this grid. Yes. Um, so if you have an odd number of squares, you can do a checkerboard. Um, and then um, you can have, um, yeah, so if you do a checkerboard, like in, in this example, um, we could put like a black square here and a white square here. Um, and then you're t every single black square is touching a white square. Every single white square is touching a black square. Um, so B is just your number of black squares which is like ceiling of nm over two, and white is floor nm over two, so that works. Um, can you think of a way to modify that if you have an even number of squares? Or if at least one of, yeah, at least one of n and m is even? Because again, remember, we're not counting black squares that don't touch any white squares. This is probably not a great example because we do have every black square touching a white square. But say if, if, for example, this square was white, then we would still only have W equals four. This one would not count because it's not touching any black squares if we made it white. So anyone have any ideas for how to modify the checkerboard idea if one of the dimensions is even? 
or does anyone have a completely different idea? Okay, so basically what you're saying is do the checkerboard and then pick one square and color it um, black, right, I think? And that would uh, decrease your number, that would decrease W by one. Wait. There's a whiteboard feature apparently uh, on this, if you want to try that. There's like a, I don't know, I don't know how it works, but I just saw that today that wasn't the last time if you go into oh wait okay so the three dots yeah so i think all of the solutions you guys are coming up with work um it's the alternating rows one um i think if you make two two black that would give you w equals Oh, and the even length, okay. I think that might give you B equals W plus two though. Um, so what Rajat is saying, I think that would work. No, I, I think that would, um, I think you would still have N, I think you'd have the same number of each if you just change the top black square of the boundary to white, right? Because um, I think you still have, like let's say you have N rows, you would still have N white squares touching a black square on the left border. Um, and you would have N black squares touching white squares on the same thing. But yeah, that's, that's sort of a nicer way to think about it. Yeah, Rajat got it. Um, so when I solved this, I basically did the checkerboard way. And then you can, if the checkerboard is like an even number of squares, you can just pick one of the corners and change the color. Um, but it turns out that's way too complicated. You don't need to do anything nearly that complicated. What you can do is just do that. Just put one white square in the corner, everything else black. Then you have W equals one, B equals two, and you're done. And uh, this will always work because if you look at the constraints, again, that's important. You have N and M are both at least two. So you can always do this and it will always work out. Yeah, it, it's insane. Like I said, when this contest happened, I did like the checkerboard thing and like the mess with one of the corners if you have to, but this is much easier. Okay. So yeah, again, this is like sort of the kind of solution that will show up in these constructive problems. All right, um, so now uh, LCM problem. So you're given L and R, um, let's say they're up to 10 to the 18th. So we have to have some constant time thing. Um, and we wanna find X and Y that are uh, in the range L to R where X is less than Y. Um, and their LCM is also in the range L to R. Um, where LCM is their least common multiple. Um, one important fact for a lot of problems, maybe not necessarily this specific one, um, but you can get the LCM of two numbers by taking their product over their GCD. So greatest common divisor. Um, so yeah, if we have this example where L is one, R is 15, we can do x equals 6, y equals 4. And then their LCM would be x times y, which is 24, divided by their GCD, which is 2. So you get an LCM of 12, which is also in range. OK. And note that unlike the AB problem, we do have to have x less than y. So they can't be the same number.
Yes. So if L is one, then you can do one in R. And so if L is not one, so sort of how do you extend that solution? Um, yes, yeah, so that would work if you do like um, floor division of R divided by L. Um, wait, did that work? I mean, no, not necessarily. So right? if, if that's in range, then that works. Yeah, R, yeah, R over L has yeah. to be in range, that's what you're saying, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Yes, but yeah, if, if that's in range, then that would work. Um, So one thing to think about is how can you like minimize the LCM? Yes, uh, so we're not saying you can do L and 2L. Um, and then your LCM will be 2L, which would also be in range, uh, assuming that like 2L is in range. Um, so one question is, let's say 2L is not in range, then what do you do? Um, also, um, so this isn't like the last one. There's not always a solution. So if there's no solution, you just print out no solution. Because like, let's say you had L equals eight, R equals nine. Your only choice would be eight comma nine, which doesn't work. So. So how do you handle the case when two L is not in range? This is kind of a trick question. Uh, you can't do L and L because they have to be different. Yep, they all have to be integers. Um, well, uh, two L doesn't have to be in range, right? The polymine could literally give you two integers where L. L I think he means like has to be in range in order for there ah. to be a solution. Okay. which uh, is kind of a big hint, but that's on the right track. So 2L, L and 2L will work as long as it's in range. Um, what are you saying? Yeah, um, so that's one thing that you could do. Um, and it turns out if you did that, you would be correct. Because if 2L is not in range, then it is impossible. So what you can do is um, just uh, do L, 2L. If it's in range, otherwise print impossible. Um, so notice that for any X and Y, your LCM is going to be at least L. Um, because it has to be at least X, which is at least L, right? So we just need to find a pair where it's less than R. So let's try to minimize the LCM and see what we can do. Uh, so because they're not equal, their LCM has to be at least 2x, right? Because you have to pick two multiples. Uh, you have to pick a multiple of x 
that is not x, right? Because y is greater than x. So their LCM is gonna be at least 2x, which is at least 2L. So if r is less than 2L, there's no solution because the LCM of these two numbers has to be at least 2L. Um, and so yeah, otherwise you can just take L 2L, um, which will both be in range and then their LCM will be two. So then you're good. Why can you simplify um, the LCM of X and Y that way? I'm still a little bit confused. So you got that from the original oh, form. Uh, for here? Yeah. Um, so basically the LCM of X and Y has to be a multiple of X, right? Yeah. And it can't be X itself because we know that Y is bigger than X. So Y can't be a uh, divisor of X. So, so okay. their LCM can't be X itself. So it has to be like kx for some k. And the minimal k we can get is two. Okay. Right. Because yeah, it, it basically has to be a multiple of x that's not x itself. That's bigger than x itself. So it has to be at least two x. Any other questions on this? Okay. All right, uh, so before we get to the next problem, uh, just some quick like string terminology. Uh, so we say that a string A is a subsequence of a string B if the characters of A appear in order, um, but not necessarily consecutively in B. So if you have like um, the string ABC, that appears as a subsequence of this string because you have like A, B, C in order. Uh, even though you can have like other characters between them, um, it appears as a subsequence. So you can like delete some characters from this string basically to get this one. And then we also say that the period of a string S is the smallest K such that SI equals SI plus K for all I. And you can sort of think of that as breaking up the string into pieces of size K that all match. So like if your string is five zeros, you can break that up into five copies of just zero, which is the size one, right? So the period is one. And if you have this string, you can break it up into um, copies of strings of length three. So the period is three. All right, makes sense. Okay. So now getting into the actual problem, um, you're given a string S of size N, you have to print a string T such that um, S is a subsequence of T. So we can delete some characters from T to get S. T has size at most 2N and T has the minimal possible period. So if S is a bunch of ones, then you can print out T as basically S, which will have period one. Um, and if S is one, one, zero, you can print T as one, zero, one, zero, which has period two. And note that this uh, S here is a subsequence of T because we can delete this zero to get S. Yeah, yeah. Oh, binary. yes, yeah, all the strings are binary. Yes, yeah, so you only have zeros and ones. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think PK has another very close, yeah, uh, basically has it. Yeah, um, so that's missing one case. Um, so if you look at this first case, uh, you can't print like one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero, because that has period two and you can get period one here. Um, but that's like very much an edge case because the only time you can get period one so if a string is period one, that means all the characters have to be the same. Um, so if all the characters are match, or if all the characters of S match, you can just print S, which gives you period one, right? And that's obviously gonna be minimal because you can't have a period less than one. So otherwise we can't have period one because we have at least two characters that don't match, but we can get period two by basically doing um, what PK was saying, um, by just printing out like say zero one n times. So for n equals four, we can just print out zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one. 
And note that um, S will always be a subsequence of this. Because like, let's say this is your S. You can look at the copies of zero and one, and at each copy, you can just pick zero or one based on which character of S you need. So like for the first pair here, we pick zero. For the second pair, we pick one. The third pair, we pick one. Fourth pair, we pick zero. Fifth pair, we pick one. So we can sort of pick out the characters of S from each of these pairs and always get it as a subsequence. All right, so um, going back to the requirements, uh, S is a subsequence like we just showed. Um, and T has size at most 2n. Turns out it has size exactly 2n. Um, and has minimal possible period because we have period two and it's impossible to get period one because we have some mismatching characters. Okay, uh, any questions on this one? Yeah, so again, um, it's basically just like looking for the trick you can use and especially paying attention to the constraints because um, the size at most 2n thing becomes very important for this problem. Okay. All right, even picture. Um, so in this one, you're given an infinite grid of squares. You can think about it as like the XY plane or whatever. And you want to color some of the cells gray such that no gray cell has an odd number of gray neighbors and exactly N gray cells have all four neighbors gray. So um, again, in this problem, we're only counting neighbors that are like adjacent by a side. So diagonal does not count. So in this problem, uh, this would be N equals four because you have these four squares in the middle all have exactly four gray neighbors. Um, so how you generalize this for more N? And another hint is, again, this picture here is intentionally misleading. So think about other ways that you can um, do this. Maybe we could try to like set up a jam board for this. It might be nice to have people drawing. Uh, that's what I was saying. There's these three dots at, at the right, at the bottom right of, and there's like a yeah. whiteboard option. Yeah. Does that like work? That's insane. All right, wait, let me, I tried making one at the beginning and it sent the link at the beginning. But that was before anyone was here. Oh, so. it, it, oh, it doesn't open in Meet, it just opens an external Jamboard? Or... It, it opened up like another uh, Chrome window for me. So does this link work for you guys? Oh, I just sent a link. Okay, that's like boring. Okay, fine. Well, it's, still, oh. it's, still, it's still good. It doesn't open here. Yeah, I thought it would open. But um, it's still, it's if still anyone good. wants to like get on here and like draw a picture, Maybe you could present it, so then... Yes, okay. Also, um, also it's asking permissions, you haven't... Oh. Anyone with Wait, the link I, can edit. I have to confirm you? Yeah, yeah. you can set anyone with the link, right? Can, can view. Yeah, yeah. Um... Oh, um, I think it's only letting people, oh, anyone with the link. Okay, cool. All right, so you guys should be able to draw on here. Uh, I can present this screen to you. So can you guys see the Jamboard? Okay, nice, I see someone drawing. Um, so if you guys have any ideas for how to do this, um, you can just draw them here.
Oh, it's view only? Wait, I saw someone drawing. Um, I can change that. Uh, it says anyone with the link can edit. Do I need to send the link again? I might. It seems to be working for... Okay. Uh, for I, I sent it again just in case. Okay. Alright. Uh, just to get you guys started, here's the answer for n equal 1. It's very easy. It's just this, right? I forgot what it was. Actually, sorry about it. I forgot what it was. What was it? Oh, yeah, I remember now. That was unfortunate. Well, that's just, that, that one works, but it's also multiple. Yeah, I'll see it. Which one is Yuki? Is it the bottom left here? Yeah, so thinking about uh, like the n equals one case is useful. Um, so yeah, I think whoever's drawing on the bottom uh, is sort of on the right track because for the n equals one case, you have to have something like this, right? And now you need to Basically, yeah, so th that exactly works. You can do something like this. And then you have one square with four neighbors, and everything else has two. So notice that if it can't have four neighbors and it can't have an odd number of neighbors, it has to have exactly two. I mean, that means you can't really have sides as much as corners, uh, is what you want to prefer, because corners right. need two. So any ideas on like how to generalize this to more? Yeah. Oh, that's also, <laughs> yes, you, you can also just draw that one shape over and over. Um, I think, did they specify that it had to be connected in the actual one? I'm not sure, but yeah, you, you can just draw the same shape over and over again. Or um, uh, what whoever drew this did, you can basically just extend it and go up and just keep adding more uh, with four neighbors like this. Um, so you can go back to- It says it has to be connected. Now. I checked the problem. <laughs> it has to oh, connected. it does have to be connected. OK. Uh, yeah, I should have specified that. But so yeah, now going back to the presentation. So here are two options uh, you can do. So this is the one we just saw, um, where you sort of keep adding more of these L shapes on top. Um, and then you can get like arbitrarily many of these squares. Um, and you can also do a pattern like this, um, where you keep adding like one more square on to the end um, to get one more. And sort of the idea behind this one is um, all the non four neighbor squares have to have exactly two neighbors. So you can sort of think of them as edges between two other squares. So you can sort of think of this as like a loop from this to itself and now an edge like that. Yeah, I don't know, but either one of these configurations would work. All right. Okay, um, and one last problem. So uh, anti-Sudoku. So you're given a solved Sudoku puzzle and you wanna change the values of at most nine squares such that no row, column, or three by three vo box is valid. So basically every single row, column, and box has a repeated value somewhere. 
and you have to change at most nine squares. Uh, so you don't have to move around the values. You can set them equal to anything you want, anything between one and nine. But you're only allowed to change nine squares. So one thing is, can you change less? Um, Peter, not Peter, really. has, huh? Peter has an idea. So if you change the things in the diagonal, you'll get every row and column, but you're not going to get every box. Right, you're, you're only going to get these three boxes. Right, yeah, so you, you need exactly nine, uh, which is one for each box, and also one for each column and one for each row, right? Um, so we need to select exactly nine. And all of them need to be in different rows, columns, and three by three boxes simultaneously. Right, because we can't sort of double up on any of those or else it won't work. Right, yeah, so we, we can put a duplicate in every 3 by 3 but we have to, like, simultaneously break all the rows and columns, too. One hint is, like, a diagonal is a specific type of permutation. Maybe you can think about a different permutation that also takes care of some other, the box condition. So one thing is, like, let's say you look at the top three, right? You need to pick um, one square in each of the boxes and one square in each of the rows. So you have to pick like one, um, you have to pick them all in distinct boxes and distinct rows for these three. And then you can sort of do a similar thing here, but now they also have to be in different columns than all of these ones. So if we just change the first square of all the three by threes, then that's only going to hit three of the rows and three of the columns. But we need to hit all nine. This is this is kind of a hard like pattern to describe through text. Um, you could try explaining it verbally, uh, but what I'm trying to say is like, uh, for example, the top left box, you could yeah. change the one. And then in the second okay. box going horizontally, you could change the nine. Uh, and the third box, change the five. And then once you get to the next row, just shift that pattern over one. So you get rid of the six in the fourth box. Yep. And then the uh, four, the fifth box, and the three in the sixth box. And you shift over the pattern one more again. And do that for the last three. I'm just not sure if right. you need to do like a specific type of number so that it holds true. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically what you can do. Um, so you basically can get a pattern in these first three, like say pick the top left and then the middle left and the bottom left. Because now you're picking in like, like I said, three different rows on the top here. Um, and then we do the same thing in these three, but we shift it over to the right by one. So we hit three different columns. And then again here, same thing, but we shift it over to the right by one to get the last three columns. And now once you, that you have all these squares, all you have to do is set each of them to one of the other eight values, because um, you know that that value has to appear in the square and the column and the row. And you know that no other square that you're messing with is in the square or the row or the column. So you can change it to anything with um, basically anything. 
So you could do something like, if they're 1, set them equal to 2, otherwise set them equal to 1, or something along those lines. You could just say, like, set it to the number plus 1, and if it's 9, just make yeah. it 1. Yeah, that works too. Uh, basically anything like that. Okay. All right, uh, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, these slides are in the info channel on Discord. We have a folder with all of our slides.